partner with a financial person, your bookkeeper, your tax advisor, whoever it is that you can trust and be very vulnerable and ask questions with. That was Christina Springstead from Springstead Solutions. Christina has 20 years of experience in helping others develop and operate their business successfully. A certified public bookkeeper equipped with an MBA from Keller Graduate School of Management and a Profit First Certification Mastery Level, she has set the foundation for Springstead Solutions. Her passion is to see businesses thrive and help clients build long-term success for themselves personally and professionally. In her free time, you will find her playing cards with friends, enjoying dinner and a movie with family, and then traveling to new places. In today's show, we discuss Profit First Professionals Organization. Then later in the show, we talk about how Christina started her business. And lastly, be sure to stay tuned to hear about some of the tips that she and Amanda have to get ready for tax season. Welcome back to the Our Two Cents podcast, the show where your local professionals sit down with an array of guests to hear their story and impart some wisdom for both business and life improving skills. This is your place to hear business and community leaders discuss relevant topics that matter to you. And welcome to the show today. I am John Duffield, CPA, and I'm your host today along with Amanda DiGiacomo. So we have a full room of accounting types today because of our guest. Uh, before we get into today's episode, I would like to encourage our followers to follow us on Instagram at Our Two Cents Podcasts. That's plural. Our Two Cents podcast and sign up for our monthly uh, kind of just notifications, if you will. By doing that, you get to stay up to date on new releases and giveaways and, and, and everything Instagram, right? Christine, we're really excited to having you on the show today. Thank you for being here. I've been around your husband a decent amount, but you and I have never met, so it's good to be able to do so. Welcome. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me. Good. So you're the founder and owner of Springstead Solutions. Tell us about you and what you do in your business. All right. So myself, I'm a, a numbers nerd junkie. I love it. Um, I tried to get away from it a long time ago, but found I love doing bookkeeping and helping people with their cash flow problems. So I grew up really poor. Cash flow was always a huge issue in our household. And so then I just started helping some of my friends on the side, doing a side gig bookkeeping and started to love it and grew Then I found Profit First, which is, if you don't know it, it's a book that was written by Mike Michalowicz. It's about cash flow for small businesses and entrepreneurs because so many of them, when you look at the statistics, have cash flow problems, decided to get certified, and that is what propelled me into launching Springstead Solutions. So I have a bit of a bookkeeping foundation, but I really focus on cash flow management strategies using tools like Profit First. I'm also a financial fitness formula, which is another certification system out there for cash flow management. So that is my passion, helping small businesses, entrepreneurs, make sure that they're paying attention to their cash flow so that they don't run into those problems down the road when certain things come along, like COVID or potential 2023 uh, issues that we might be seeing with uh, the recession that everyone keeps talking about. So that is my passion and my love. Yep. So I saw that you're a profit first professional and part of the crazy Mike Michalowicz team. Yep. You guys are a crazy individual. How did that yep. come about? So I went to a business conference back in 2019. And in that, when you go to these, they have the, all these Facebook groups now, right? Where everybody can talk. And I just kept hearing people talk about profit first and was, what is the system? I want to learn about it. So downloaded the Audible. And as I was listening to it, it hit me. There was so many stories in how he came about with the system that matched so many of my clients and friends that I had were in business. And I thought, this is an easy to follow system that a lot of people needed that could ensure if people were disciplined enough and and they weren't too far gone, that people could have money to do things like pay their taxes. So tax time is coming and tax bills are going to be coming soon. And that's one of the biggest things you hear is I got this major tax bill, no clue how I'm going to pay it. And so it was a system that was set up and easy. I went through the interview process. There's an entire certification. I loved the entire team. The home base is completely supportive. The community is global and we have, I just have an entire global community of people that I can tap into to help my clients in whatever industry they're in. So that that's how that happened. Yes, he is crazy. He's a ton of crazy fun and he's really passionate about helping other people too, which I can get behind. Yeah, absolutely. Amanda, have you seen Profit First? you had any clients that have ever? Yeah, her and I were talking about a little bit off air here. You know, I have some much larger clients that the system works fantastic on. And then I was telling her on some of my smaller sole proprietor clients, it's kind of really hard to adapt to it. And I was asking her if there's something she can shed with me uh, on some advice and she is certified on it because it is really hard when you don't have that consistent income coming in to set those rules for profit first. So I think it is an interesting topic. I I have seen it work and I've seen it not work. So I think the thing, if I I can interject here, is um, I think that's very common. That's why some of us are certified, because if you just took the book off the shelf and went to launch it, it is not going to work for everybody. There has to be a starting point, some sort of extra credit. So 
you have someone coming in the profit account, which most people think, oh, it's profit. That's just my money. You know, that's one of the biggest things. But the profit account, first and foremost, is for we'll call it an emergency fund. That's its first purpose. It's not about paying the owner profit. So as you're going through, you'll see some people if they started the system too late, or maybe they're brand new and they need more startup capital. That's where you would tweak those percentages and really figure out what was working and quarterly reassess where you at. So he's got your caps and your taps, right, mm-hmm. which is your target allocated percentages. This is based on thousands of companies that he he has personally researched to say these are ones that are considered fiscally healthy and can make it through trials. So it's not going to work. The book numbers are not going to work for everyone. Right. They need to be tailored. And I think that's the biggest thing. But the system within itself is set up so that you can be successful. If you're trying to go straight out of the book with no adjustments for your personal story, some people will struggle for sure. Yeah, yeah I definitely could see why somebody could struggle with that because mm-hmm. I've seen a lot of accounting records where, where people have used it or tried to use it at the very least, right? Mm-hmm. And and I think I get it without, you know, becoming a, a certified myself or, or reading the book. Mm-hmm. I think I kind of conceptually get it. I, I have a client that's done a great job, you know, utilizing it and moving money around. One of the things that I find fascinating about it is with Profit First, you guys recommend that they actually have multiple real bank accounts. Tell us about that portion. Yeah, we do. And when I first went into it, I hesitated. I was struggling with that. But I did open up the five core accounts. And I can understand why, because there's been certain times where maybe a client didn't pay on time and you're so tempted to borrow against something. And if you're just doing this off of a spreadsheet, it's very easy to say, well, I'll just pay it back later. And you probably won't. A lot of people, bookkeeping we're talking about is like, I got to reconcile all these extra accounts. That's the thing I said was most kind of annoying is that now I have five to seven accounts that I have to do transfers between. I have to reconcile, which now makes my bill as a bookkeeper higher. Well, and I think as a certified part, being as I'm part of that is we recognize like here are all these accounts and that's part of it. But the bulk of those accounts should be very easy to reconcile. There's right. a couple of transfers, almost nothing. The tax account, you're putting money in once a month, maybe twice a month, and you're pulling it out once. Very few transactions to have to reconcile. So for me, knowing that people, like you have to intentionally transfer out of a bucket of money for mm-hmm. something, and it's a couple extra seconds to reconcile because there's not really a lot happening. In my opinion, the benefit of them having very distinct buckets of what they can go into is right. worth a couple extra, you know, moments that it's going to take to reconcile those accounts. So I think it's the cash flow consistency that they have and mm-hmm. they can very much see it. But okay. the banking fees, because it's like $35 per bank or sometimes it's $15 a month. How do you get your clients around that type of fees? So for a lot of the accounts, I recommend local credit unions. They're very mm-hmm. small. You know, mine has $5 and whatever their minimum is, that's my zero. So that is my zero balance. And then, you know, you've got $35 that are tied up. Some, I won't name which bank I bank with a lot, but it's $500. Those are excessive. So I've looked for other banking, you know, more local regional ones that'll work with you if you're in business. Mm, Interesting. Yeah, it's interesting that... um you know, there are, are a bunch of bank accounts and I and I can see that if a client used it right, and that's the key, if they used it right, yes. right, there wouldn't be a lot of transactions between those different accounts. And so it wouldn't be yep. wouldn't be too too bad from that perspective. How often do you see people kind of violating that and and, and doing whatever they want to do? It can happen often. So I think and that's the whole point of the certified is I think people need accountability. I need it myself. I mean, I'm in this business myself and if I Christmas will get me every time. I lose my mind financially at Christmas if I'm not <laughs> monitoring myself, right? So I need to have my own account accountability check. But a lot of times that happens when there's a scarcity mindset of something coming up and they're freaking out or they have the shiny solution syndrome that we were talking about. So it can happen. But what I found is it it has happened with people who haven't quite hit rock bottom enough, if that makes sense. Mm So and, and it all depends. I had a client who did great with Profit First for two and a half years. They were doing fantastic just this last year. Something happened personally. And so that's where we go through and we talk about why is this happening? What is causing you to dip in? And we readjust because things change. And so violating typically happens more on a, something happened emotionally in their personal life. That's usually where I found that, that it has taken place. Because then there's the whole, you have all your structure, but if you're going to invest in something and you know that, you adjust your percentages and you can start making a plan for that. And so it's all being diligent and planning each quarter with where you're going. Yeah, I got to tell you, it's it's interesting. I've got a lot of clients and I've been at this a long time mm-hmm. and, and I'm not really that shy about telling, giving clients my opinion. It strikes me as though most of the business owners out there live to their means at the very least, if, if not beyond their means, right? Mm-hmm. And when yeah. I say they live to their means, they don't let enough money accumulate inside that business so that that business can continue to grow. Yep. And so, you know, they're taking whatever that profit happens to be and, and tend, tend to be taking that out in, in salaries or distributions or whatever it happens to be. 
to be. And so mm-hmm. it's always on the edge to in in my mind, right? And yeah. so, you know, the mindset should be accumulating some money, accumulating some assets so that that business has, has got that right equity to kind of continue to grow and, and do what it needs to do and have that right right amount of working capital. So tell us about the coaching model. If somebody mm-hmm. were going to work with you on that and you were going to get started, what's that look like? So we would first and foremost talk. <laughs> I don't go straight into it. So one, I want to know what their money mindset is. Uh, How do they view their business? You know, we're talking about it's end of the year right now. And I'm actually having to convert from an LLC to an S corp. And so I even have to make changes myself and say, how are you viewing your business? Are you following the model of your business? S corp owners, are you paying yourself like you're supposed to? And if you're drawing and is your salary reasonable beyond any means? Like what is your mindset on your business? Is it your piggy bank? Because that's what I think you were talking about is a lot of people are viewing this business as a piggy bank. Things are going great. They're pulling everything out as they can. And then a dip comes down and they're like, oh boy, how are we going to pay for all this? So we talk about a money mindset. What are you doing? Where are you at right now? So we do an entire profit blueprint, which there's an instant assessment in the book, but we go deeper dive. Uh, We look at how they're spending their money. How are they pricing? We go through 11 different profit points, marketing, return of eyes, uh, ROIs. We go through 11 different profit points, like I mentioned, and assess everything that they're doing. Also, what are their goals? Do you have enough staff? Do you not? Are you wanting to open up a new location? Do you need more fleet vehicles? So we're actually going to go lay out the entire picture of where is your business now? Where are you going? Let's analyze your finances. Let's do deep dives into your numbers. Can this support where you're at? Can it support where you're wanting to go? And then we say, here's where your current allocation percentages would be if you're falling profit first. Here's where you need to go. And here's a rollout plan, however many quarters it might take for us to get there. And what are we going to do? We're going to check expenses first and cut there. We're going to check your pricing. Are you pricing right? Do you need to increase your pricing because maybe prices have gone up and you haven't raised your prices in three years? So we literally go through the entire gamut. I look at expenses. Do you have multiple softwares that are doing the same thing that maybe you're just paying for them because they're on an auto renew and you're not paying attention, right? Sure. So it's someone else doing a deep dive into the finances and saying, what is this about and do we need that? You've got this. You're paying Angie's list if there was a contractor. Are you getting any leads? Have you paid attention? If you are, are you just throwing money out the door and not? So it dives into all of those pieces. And I also like to look at it operationally. Here's your staff. Here's where your salary's at. You've got this many people. You've got a ton in this, you know, you've got a ton of people making a bunch of money, but they're not billable. Is that necessary? You don't have enough billable people. So we dive into all of the operational parts through a financial lens. It's needed, you mm-hmm. know, tremendously by too many business owners, I think, just yes. because, you know, I, I heard you ladies talking about before we got started talking about bookkeeping and, and the fact that not very many people actually look at the results of their financial statements, mm-hmm. right? And yes. so, you know, or even think they need bookkeeping or respect bookkeeping. That's a big one. And or they come to us years down the line, and they've done it themselves. And now we have to do a complete cleanup. And they're like, Oh, I didn't realize there was all these other different things, a part of bookkeeping. And I think getting the word out there that bookkeeping is a crucial to see what your proper financials are to tax strategize is the point. And it's an investment, you know, in the whole scheme of things is if you want to do a business right. And most people are like, send me my profit and loss. Well, that's only part of your story. You need your balance sheet. And you mm-hmm. understand what that is. You need to look at your statement of cash flows and everyone's just like the P&L. Maybe you got someone bookkeeping, right? And they're doing it properly and you take draws. None of that's on your P&L. And right. then you're wondering like, hey, I made 10 grand. Why have I got $5 in the bank? Mm-hmm. And that's the whole thing is it's commodity viewed, right? And yep. it's it's an investment. It's not an expense. And I think that's my passion project too, is which I'm great to sit into a room of peers is, you know, a lot of times bookkeeping, especially as we get written off until it's tax time, right? Like, oh, I need you to clean up 12 months of stuff that happened. And you're like, oh my goodness, bookkeeping should be one of the first investments that business people look at. And then when they get their financials, actually look at them and ask questions and start to educate themselves. Right. Yeah, I, you know, and Christine, I'm ashamed to admit this, but you know, that's really what the business should be about if, you know, of not taxation necessarily, Mm -hmm. or, or, but, you know, when it comes to, you know, business advisors, it would be, you know, helping people become more successful, helping, help them be more profitable and kind of guiding them, teaching them and coaching them and and getting the right direction. So it's, uh, I think it's a fantastic thing. Tell us about, first of all, the biggest struggle that you have when you get clients. What, what's your constant struggle with most of these clients that you have? Getting information. <laughs> when you, yeah. I think that's the biggest thing. We really focus on getting source documentation. So Amanda, I don't know if you see this, but so many people are like, I've got my bank statements, just go off of that. And it, that's great. And you know, a lot of people, do you need to keep your receipts? 
if you get audited, yeah, you need sure. to provide some documentation. And that is a lost art form, I think. And so we really do our best not to just look at a transaction, just throw it in a bucket and move on. We're not trying to be transactional, we're strategic. So when we're asking clients for, can you get us your bank statements? Can you get us this receipt? Can you tell us what this was for? Could you not pay someone until you've gotten a, a W-9, right? right? So we can 1099 them. It's getting the information back. And I understand they just get lost in the day to day. But again, this is a partnership, right? We're not just vendors, we're partners and trying to get timely information so that we can turn around and get their books to them. I have multiples where I can't close out the books for two or three months because they're we're holding up on waiting sure. for information. So yeah, that's a constant battle. I know. Mm-hmm. I know Mandy, Venmo. You, yeah, we, Venmo. Yes. It's any of these third party apps trying to get vendor names. Of who, well, why do I have to provide you a vendor name? Well, because we have to 1099 them. You know, we need to follow all these other regulations or even loan documents yes. or asset documents. They take out a loan and, you know, our new credit card or something and then never inform us. And then now, you know, it's December and I'm like well, what is this one huge payment you just paid off and like oh well I have this like loan or something and I'm like okay well I need that information now yep. so yeah I, I would agree getting information from the client sometimes can be a struggle mm-hmm. and what's unfortunate is when that happens right that adjusts your financials so mm-hmm. say they did that in June you've been giving them financials with an unknown and then they go back and you're like you didn't even have correct financials because we you didn't let us know so that would be my encouragement is like they need to look at it as a partner right, right. An investment and a partner so. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. So th- that's a good struggle. Give me another one because that's not the one I thought you were going to tell me about. Oh. For the record, is <laughs> I, I, but I, I know we all deal with that. I know yeah. all, I know all three of us do that. Yep. Have to beat our clients over the head to get documentation from them sometimes. But what else? What I mean, th- thinking about you know the model of profit first mm-hmm. and and actually you helping clients manage or coach their business. What's your biggest struggle? That is uh, commingling and clients like treating their business as a piggy bank. And so we kind of talked about that. Um, for me, that's the biggest struggle is is getting them, like you're mentioning, is just pulling money randomly out of the uh, company, trying to get them to explain like, this is pay for it personally and get yourself an al- accountable plan or get yourself a reimbursement type plan or take a draw, do that. Um, but that's one of the biggest struggles is that they're not looking forward. They're just looking at how much profit is in the account right now. And we're just going to take it right now. And there's no foresight of three, six months down the road. What are we looking at? Have you even forecasted what your sales are going to be? Does that mean you're going to have enough to pay your recurring expenses? And so that's the biggest thing and getting owners to understand what is a draw? Why does your salary need to match? Like why does all of this matter? Because it does. Sure. So if you were to give one piece of advice, so we have listeners and you were going to go give some advice to somebody today that you think would make a huge impact on their business, what would that be? Partner with a financial person, your bookkeeper, your tax advisor, whoever it is that you can trust and be very vulnerable and ask questions with. Like make sure you have a, a partner that you're working with because what I've heard from a lot of people is they don't ask questions because they feel dumb. And that means they can't talk to their provider. The provider, they haven't established communication. So they need somebody that they can refer to and have a trusted source. To me, that is your bookkeeper first or it is your tax preparer. Definitely tax strategy. Don't just tax prepare because there's a bunch of CPAs out there, you know, just taking money and filing a tax return, but not helping people understand what's happening. You were talking about tax laws changing and everything Mm -hmm. coming up and find someone, some financial provider that will work with you and help educate you, but also do a little education on your own. There's Google and YouTube is out there for a lot of stuff, but understand what running a business actually means when it comes to cash. You know, it's interesting. I have a client that's relatively new client to me and very, very large business. The guy doesn't want to come into my office. He just is out in the field too busy mm-hmm. likes me but i'm too busy don't want to come see you or whatever and and so i've been bugging the heck out of him and i said hey we need to go over financial statements and i don't feel comfortable with what i'm seeing right right and so he finally said okay i'll come in and we sat down and one of the things that he was doing was is he was making a lot of money in the business but he was loaning it to other people and so yeah. well, why are you loaning it well because they need help and i said are you going to get repaid and he said oh i'm, I'm sure that i will and so we started digging deeper and i learned that he in fact had been paid back some of the loans that he had gotten and his bookkeeper had put the money in with a regular deposit so it was coded to revenues mm-hmm. right and i'm talking about three hundred thousand dollars and so you know it was one of those things that that would have never happened if you know we're just sitting there on the outside and kind of just doing it and not paying attention and not mm-hmm. asking questions and everything else yep. but that happens every single day and so it definitely makes sense to be spending more and t- more and more time with it by the time this show airs it's going to be too late for your in tax planning tips because this is going to air after uh, December 
first. Mm -hmm. But Amanda, you were talking about some stuff to get prepared, uh, some things that we should be doing kind of going into the new year. So Christina, Amanda, tell us, give us some of your best ideas about that. Yeah, of course. One thing I'd like to um, talk about, because we did a podcast a couple months ago, you and I, and we talked about tax changes. And I was the one that talked about the 1099K. The last couple of days, the IRS did delay that new um, law that came out this year. So original law is that if you made over $20,000 on a third party app, which would be Square, Venmo, PayPal, they would provide you with 1099K, which you would report on your taxes. They changed that law in 2022, where if it was $600, they would provide you the 1099K. And we've been reporting about that all year long to get you prepared. However, the IRS did delay that till 2023. So that is one something I want kind of to kind of get out there. And so people know that they don't exactly have to look for that 1099K unless you made over $20,000 on that third party app this year, but you know, start gearing up for it 2023. And so that's one thing I would like to kind of start. But I think we're talking about like making sure we have the correct documents and getting it to John, who's going to be preparing the taxes and making sure and kind of going through a checklist on how you can close out your books and reconcile if you want to give some tips and then I can give some. Mm -hmm. Can I back up and ask a question on that 1099K? Because I don't understand that. There's been some debate in my office. So Mm -hmm. the way the rule read was that if it was over $600, then PayPal or Venmo or whoever was going to send us this 1099K. Correct. Historically, though, us as accountants, we were sending 1099s to all of these vendors anytime any kind of money was spent. So we were tracking this vendor information Mm -hmm. in some accounting software, and we were sending a 1099. So were we supposed to send a 1099, and they were supposed to send a 1099? Who's doing that? Great question. And they did just kind of go over that right now in tax continued education. And and what they're saying is going forward with the new tax law, us tax professionals or CPAs or bookkeepers or CFOs are not supposed to send the 1099 NEC if it was from a third party app with this new tax law. Now they delayed the tax law, they're not going to be receiving a 1099 K unless it was $20,000 or more. So now I would revert to, we would still have to file them for this year because now they're not going to be filed. There's been some debate around that topic where if you even have to do it because it's on a third party app and it's being electronically tracked, if you still have to 1099 them, and I would say, I paid them over $600 a year. I'm going to follow the IRS. I'm 1099ing them. I would say continue to do that process for this year. In 2023, they specifically said, do not do that because now it's double reporting it to the IRS and now the IRS will then flag that person's tax return. Yeah, but ladies, think about this though. Mm. How do I know that Venmo is going to send a 1099K and they're going right. to send it, they're going to send it at the end of January and the client is going to receive it sometime in February, but it's mm. also my obligation to issue 1099s at the end of January. And so am I sitting around waiting around to go, you know, what, what am I getting or what am I not getting? Right. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think I know the answer in part is ask the client and go, Hey, if you had a bunch of transactions through Venmo or PayPal or whatever. And so you can get some sort of feel from that perspective, but it's a pain in the neck. What I've been told, and I think I, I was just reading a 13 page memo from the IRS actually two days ago up about this. It's exciting life you lead. Yeah. Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I was told before the IRS just sent out this information was that unless it was created as a business account, so like you can have a Venmo personal account and a Venmo business account. If you didn't have a Venmo business account or any type of third party that was a business account, you wouldn't receive the 1099K, which then goes into your original question. Well, I've been Venmoing this person and paying them. How do I know if they have a business account or not? And do I need a 1099 them? And I think the IRS was getting a lot of these questions where on the document, I was was reading, it sounds like if anybody made anything over $600 on these any of these apps, whether it's a business account or personal account, they're giving you a 1099K and you as the tax professional and the individual have to prove to the IRS that it was personal information instead of business. And I've even saw on there where if you're selling tickets online to your friends, that's now going to be considered gain. So I think it's drastically going to be changing. Yeah, that brings up another question. So I bought some tickets to... um 
baseball game that I was not able to go to. Mm-hmm. And um, interestingly enough, it turns out one of the um, kind of what became one of the playoff games and the value of those tickets went through the roof. And so I sold those tickets because um, I couldn't fly to St. Louis that particular weekend. So made a bunch of money. And so I'm going to get sent a 1099 from um, yeah. StubHub, you know, for the sell price of mm-hmm. those tickets. But but I have the cost of those tickets as my right. cost, right? So I definitely have some gain on there, but not... Uh, so they were saying you have to report that now on the Schedule D. So that means all of us tax preparers not only have to, you know, file the 1099K on that individual's, uh, you know, tax return, but now we have to also attach a Schedule D according to the 13-page memo that I read from the IRS. Yep. I, and again, this comes into impact in 2023, so they could change it again before then. Um But it's interesting because everybody uses these third-party apps. Mm -hmm. And so are they making people want to revert to just using cash? Because not everybody's going to want to have this 1099K and have to pay a tax professional to have to prove that it's, oh, my friend sent me money for food. Um, So I think it's interesting. I think there's a lot more debate about it. And I think the IRS has a lot more questions to answer on it. Yeah, it's interesting. Christina, so new year, right? New year. New year. Give us some give us some advice and some recommendations going forward. What would you be doing? You know, you're that profit first professional, so mm-hmm. you look at it a little bit differently in life than, than Amanda and I do, or a lot differently in life yeah. for that matter. But tell us about, you know, give us some advice and direction as to, you know, those business owners out there. What should they be doing when they start in January and kind of moving forward? They should be going through their accounting software. So I'm going to refer to QuickBooks because that's what I use. But um, going through and running reports and checking things like do they have open invoices that are not truly open that were actually paid and maybe maybe didn't get put into the system correctly. I see a lot where owners will have a client pay for something in cash and the owner just pockets it and then forgets to put it into right. into the books against the thing. And so that payment still needs to be put in and um, taken as a draw if you're not putting it back into the business. Sure. And then look at other things. Did you have one of the biggest things that people don't look at is that barter transactions need to be booked for in your system. And so do you have any where you had an invoice and maybe you traded out services and you didn't properly account for that to do that. So really going through their payables and receivables qualifying, do you use payables and receivables? Do you have invoices and um, bills that are still open and are they legitimately open? Were there payments that were somehow sent through a Venmo? You personally paid a bill and forgot to uh, qualify that. So really go through and reconcile out your payables and your receivables. And of course, your bank accounts and your credit cards and your loans. Yeah, it's interesting. I saw a, uh, as you know, the listeners may or may not know or, or, or may not want barter stuff to be taxable, right? They, yep. they, they, don't, they don't want it to be, but it is. Yeah. One of the best ways that I've ever seen is that to be accounted for is for somebody to create another checking account mm-hmm. that's a barter account. Yep. And so, you know, all of that stuff to go in and out of that, their checking account as though, you know, they were writing real checks or receiving real money or whatever. And yep. uh, it's kind of interesting to see that and, and some use it real, in real detail. It's good. That's exactly how we do it too. Yep. Good. Any other advice you have for us? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is just comb through your transactions, make sure that they're legit. If you pay for something personally and maybe didn't um, account for it, put it into your system as an owner's investment. Because if you have a legit deduction that maybe you've paid for and forgot to put in there, you want to get whatever you can in there. And then take a look at all your transactions, make sure they're put into the right category is, you know, especially if you have a bookkeeper on your side, we work with our clients always to say, you know, hey, We've categorized this based on the documentation you've given us, but is it correct? Because if something belongs in professional services, does it need to be marked to get a right. 1099? Does it not? Um, and I was going to piggyback on the 1099, not so much the case, but also make sure we changed in 2020, right? The miscellaneous became the NEC and the miscellaneous. Yes. And I have seen so many NECs forms come out on a miscellaneous form and make sure that you're doing your NEC for your contract laborers and your miscellaneous for your rent and sure. all the other 1099-able stuff. But those are due January 31st. Yes. And anything else? Would um, be- just estimated tax payment fourth quarter Mm -hmm. due January 15th. Um, Again, making sure I piggyback on her, you closing your loans out, closing any assets you might have, making sure you're putting all those on your balance sheet, and then making sure you just categorize everything and reconciled up to date. Yep, that's absolutely right. Christina, anything else you want to tell us and and Bakersfield about uh, you and and Profit First and and, uh, before we let you go? Well, they can find me at Springstead Solutions. I'm so glad to be here. I really strive to work with the community and I'm glad that we got to get 
get to, to know each other in uh, for Bakersfield, just find a financial provider, someone who can give you resources. And I think this podcast is great. So tell all of your friends to subscribe because they're giving you great information. Absolutely. But yeah, find a provider that works for you and some sort of cash flow management like that should be in 2023. Pay attention to your cash flow and make sure that you're able to cover your bills. Yeah, that's important. We always like to ask a couple of personal questions at, mm-hmm. at, of our guests at the end if we could. And so I'm going to ask you a couple of them. So what is one of the most significant life-changing events that's happened in your life? Oh my goodness. One of the most significant life-changing events. Becoming a mom. Definitely. Yeah, that's a big that one. Was, that was significant. That was like a whole quick lesson in cash flow management and time mm-hmm. management and, you know, treating your house like it's a business and do I have everything scheduled accordingly? So I, I would say that was most definitely. Yeah, I hate to admit this, but uh, as a young guy, I was pretty irresponsible. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, my wife and I made good money and we just enjoyed our lives. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you know, we have three sons. Our first son was born and there was something happened to me. It was an unconscious change of responsibility. And what's fascinating fascinating to me is I used to sleep like a rock. You could you could blow the place up around me and I would sleep th- through it. And then when my kids were born, I, I haven't slept well since, right? <laughs> and so 20, 20, 25 years later, still don't sleep well. I never got out of bed for the record. It was always my wife that, had, that did that duty. But, you know, I was always so conscious about, yep. you know, the fact that they exist and, you know, it's our responsibility. And so it was interesting. So par- parenthood, definitely. What is something that a bit of news that no one knows about you and would be shocked or surprised to hear? Oh my goodness. It can be anything, right? could be anything. I have nine tattoos. Everyone thinks I'm like square pants McGee. And um, so that's my, that's my artistic outlet. Okay. Yeah. It's interesting. My wife decided that she wanted a tattoo recently and, okay. and we, we had a big fight over the, the whole thing. <laughs> and and uh, I don't want to say that I won. One of her friends won because her friend convinced her that that was not a great idea what she wanted to do. And so she didn't get her tattoo, okay. but <laughs> had nothing to do with me though. Right. There you and go. So yeah, it was, it was interesting. Um, lastly, if you found out the world was ending in a year, how would you spend your time? Traveling. I love traveling. Oh, me too. <laughs> I hate the act of the travel, but I love when I get there. Sure. <laughs> yeah, it's a pain to be on that. You wouldn't want to be on an airplane like right now, right? No. You know, that, that, that pain of, of traveling, but uh, the experience of when you get there. Yep. So tell us about how we find Springstead Solutions. And okay. so if somebody wanted to get a hold of you, to give us your phone number. 661-615-3140. Okay. And then your website? springsteadsolutions.com. Okay, good. Linked, you're on LinkedIn. I found I your am. LinkedIn page. And that's just you, Christina Springstead, right? Yep, I do have a Springstead Solutions LinkedIn too. It's okay, not. so you got a personal and a business I page. Do. And then an Instagram page? I do have an Instagram. Yep, I have a Springstead Solutions and a Christina okay. one. No commingling on social media either. <laughs> Can't do that. <laughs> yeah, 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 perfect. I'm not much of a social media person for the record, so it's we, we have it, but I, I'm not always on it. So Amanda, yeah. anything else before we go today? No, I think it was a great episode and I hope everybody tunes in and And I mean, you have three great resources right here in the room and there's, we're excited to be here and answer your questions. Absolutely. Absolutely. Christina, thank you so much for coming in and sharing with us today. I love small business. I do those entrepreneurs and and business in general. And you got a great story and and you're helping a lot of entrepreneurs out there with what you do. Help them make money, right? Thank you. Same to you both. Absolutely. Thank you. The show has been brought to you by the law office of Kyle Jones. Troy Burton with The Lynn Company, CPA John Duffield, Scott Hansen Real Estate Lender, Broker and Investor, Dave Plivlich, President and CEO of the Marcom Group and MarcomBranding.com, and Amanda DiGiacomo, President of Atlas Financial Solutions. You've been listening to the Our Two Cents Podcast. Check out the show notes for links and more information about the show. Also visit our website at OurTwoCentsPodcast.com or catch us on Instagram at Our Two Cents Podcasts. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe and share with others. 